this is, I will tell you honestly, this is the most dangerous time in the week of a think tank, the time of a think tank to try to hold a conference. At 2 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, normally there's a, the gentle sleeping of the audience in front of us, you know, but it shows that there is a rising consciousness about this part of the world that, uh, that, in, that really ignites an intense interest, and I'm really delighted to have everybody here. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is John Hamry. I'm the president at CSIS. Uh, I'm delighted that you could all join us today. Uh, and let me say a special word of thanks to our friends from JETRO. Um, we have been fortunate to be partners with JETRO, gosh, now for probably eight or nine years. And uh, I've always been amazed at kind of their strategic vision about things they need to do in pursuit of their mission. I mean, it's very clear what their mission is, but that's a good thing. Uh, and what they've been doing is partnering with us to bring a broader policy landscape to Washington. And we've greatly valued that. It's been helpful to us. It's been helpful to the Washington policy community. You know, this is a, for being such a sophisticated country, you know, it's, we're remarkably simple-minded. You know, I mean, we, <laughs> the only thing right now we're talking about today, of course, is President Obama's speech about the Middle East yesterday. I mean, we just get completely fixated on kind of the topic of the day. And I always say this because we really do need to have friends from around the world that come and bring to our consciousness the world that we don't focus on. So that's the value of today. You know, it's why we enjoyed having the foreign minister here last week, Mike. It was really great to have him here, or actually earlier this week. It was great to have him here. It forces us to broaden our aperture and to have a wider field of view. Um, I'm particularly happy that we can, we can hold this event today. Uh, sir, and welcome. Welcome to Washington. You have, I think, since I've been here, I think this is the fourth or the fifth time that you've been willing to come, and we've... We greatly value that. It's been uh, each of these sessions I know I've learned. But then again, I start from a much lower base than most of you, and I need more to learn. Uh, we're going to have a very good afternoon. I'm going to turn to Ernie to get us started. Uh, you know, when we look at, uh, when we look at Southeast Asia, uh, it's, it's a remarkable policy void in the Washington landscape. We're trying to fill that in. There isn't the kind of deep consciousness about this part of the world, and yet it's ironic when you think about the depth of investment that we have with each other, the depth of economic interaction with each other, the depth of our interaction socially. It needs to have a broader base. That's what we're trying to do, and we're delighted to have this opportunity. Ernie, let me turn to you. Let's get this started for real, and thank you all for coming here on Friday. Dr. Hamry, thank you very much for, uh, for kicking us off. I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'd also like to, uh, to put a word of thanks into the colleagues from, from JETRO. Uh, I think Dr. Hamry said it exactly right. Uh, we have seen um, uh, our, the friends from our treaty allies and, and, the, and partners in, in, in and around uh, Asia uh, come to us and, and ask us to uh, continue to focus and prepare uh, for the East Asia Summit and, US en and encourage uh, continued U.S. engagement in Southeast Asia. It's very important. I'd also like to thank the Sasakawa Foundation. Uh, they also helped to um, uh, cover some of the travel costs related to uh, our guests from, uh, from overseas. So I want to thank, uh, thank them uh, for their support also. I, uh, I'm going to uh, stand in today uh, for Danny Russell, uh, which I, I really can't very ably do, but he uh, talked with him, I was called to his office last night, um, and I, I spent about an hour with him, but he explained and asked me to apologize that um, because Kurt Campbell is uh, in the region doing the diplomacy right now, uh, he uh, was not able to come and speak on the record on these issues. Um, so I think uh, it's not an indication of a lack of interest. Uh, he wanted me to emphasize that, but uh, rather 
uh, sort of the sophisticated uh, approach to uh, making American policy uh, and diplomacy. So, um, if you would, uh, if you would accept me as a, a less capable um, uh, speaker, I will share the U.S. perspective, uh, looking into the uh, the East Asia Summit and the, in the context of American foreign policy in uh, towards Asia. And then we'll hear from uh, Dr. Surin Pitsawan, the ASEAN Secretary General, and then of course uh, Nakatomi San, uh, Vice President for Infrastructure from JETRO on connectivity uh, as a uh, foundational concept for EAS. After that, we'll break uh, for coffee and, and um, we will reconvene in a panel discussion this afternoon that should be absolutely fascinating uh, with speakers who will be responding to what uh, was, was said this morning or this afternoon in the first panel and also adding, of course, their own uh, unique perspectives uh, to the dialogue. Let's turn to, uh, to the United States. As you know, uh, the United States, and, I, and particularly uh, President Obama, sees uh, Asia as the center of gravity uh, for three key pillars uh, of, of American interests. First, uh, Asia is the economic growth engine for the future. Second, it's the core of uh, sort of global uh, governance changes, advancing the empowerment of people, uh, the, the democracy process uh, that we see underway uh, throughout Asia is, uh, is very uh, important to the president. And then in terms of national security, um, stability uh, is dependent on knowing one another, understanding needs, and avoiding surprises. And I think uh, for these three reasons, the United States uh, just made the decision to join the East Asia Summit. Um, that was not a, an easy decision. For those of you that were involved uh, or watching the process, uh, it took a while. <laughs> it took a good while. Um, but the U.S. did decide uh, to join the East Asia Summit. And I think they did it because they believe that it's important to create frameworks for developing and sharing uh, or building a consensus on a rules-based approach and norms so that countries around the region can agree on um, on a rules-based framework so that everyone can grow uh, together and, and uh, not surprise one another in terms of uh, security issues. The U.S. also made a commitment and a bet on a strong ASEAN foundation. As you know, EAS is based on, and we'll hear more from, from Dr. Surin, on the concept of ASEAN centrality. Um, and I'm going to speak a little bit more about this. What, what is ASEAN centrality and what does it take uh, to, to hold that center. Uh, these, are, these are questions the, that the Americans had to think about before they made the commitment. And um, I think we'll be dealing with uh, uh, the implementation of, of that dis those decisions uh, in, the, in the near future. It's also a form to augment and support uh, the U.S. relations with China. Uh, quite frankly, uh, having the East Asia uh, Summit uh, and a framework, a regional framework, um, creates a better chess game uh, for the United States. If you look, if you think about grand strategy and a long-term focus uh, on Asia, um, this framework allows us to not only have a, a, and, and develop a bilateral relationship with China, but to do that in the context of a broader Asia. And that brings us to India. Um, it's very important that India is part of the EAS. And I think um, there's a strong interest uh, in the United States to bring India uh, or encourage India uh, to be part of Asia. And um, quite frankly, it, it's our partners in the region that are doing the, the legwork on this uh, by signing uh, free trade agreements with, with India, encouraging the Indians to, to be engaged diplomatically. And certainly, I think so far, we can see that the Indian private sector is probably the one that's uh, leading the way. Uh, for dissolving those old uh, anachronistic lines that divided uh, East Asia from South Asia and makes India now uh, part of Asia. But this is key, I think, to, uh, to America's uh, strategy going forward. We have common interests in alignment with our treaty allies in Asia on the, on the question of a strong uh, ASEAN and, a, and, a, and empowering the EAS, particularly Japan. Australia and Korea. Um, I would say that uh, 
part of the reason we readily agreed with our uh, JETRO colleagues to uh, work together on, on developing this conference was that uh, we all see uh, the, the vision uh, substantially the same way, and we want to work together to address these issues early, put the issues on the table early so that we can uh, form a common vision uh, before the leaders get together uh, this fall uh, in Bali. I think the Americans uh, view the EAS as a security and political architecture first and foremost. Uh, it is, we are not keen, at least this year, <laughs> uh, to, uh, to uh, pursue it as an economic or a trade architecture. The CPA, which is the Comp Com Comprehensive Economic Partnership for East Asia, uh, as is part of the EAS. Uh, I think it's not, the Americans aren't, uh, you know, against that, but I think the chips uh, from the United States are, are over in the APEC, uh, the APEC table right now, and looking at uh, the eventual free trade area of the Asia Pacific, and and specifically at negotiating a Trans-Pacific Partnership. I think the for the U.S. Uh, there's a question of how do you, how do you make the EAS uh, effective? So the principles of effective engagement um, are that uh, we must be able to table the hard issues, even if they're deemed sensitive. These include issues like the South China Sea, the Senkakus, the Dayu Islands, North Korean aggression, nonproliferation, Burma, and in governance in general. That is not to say these issues. Uh, can't be addressed in a diplomatic and um, uh, Asian context, uh, such as addressing conflicts uh, and some of these issues through the concept of connectivity, which our uh, colleague from JETRO will talk about uh, soon, and, and build confidence uh, through uh, HADR, human, uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, and joint training concepts. And all of that makes sense. Uh, but you can't duck the hard issues completely. And I think this is the nugget of, uh, if, if we can say so, Dr. Surin, this is the challenge for ASEAN. You know, centrality is dynamic, and it has to be earned, I believe. It cannot be taken for granted, ASEAN's centrality in the EAS. And I, I think that's a message that uh, the Americans uh, very much want to share. Uh, they want to work very closely with the Indonesians as chair and very closely with uh, like-minded countries to, to sort of form a consensus uh, in that direction. The other question is more uh, about American engagement in EAS is, is more mechanical, uh, and that is presidential engagement and leadership. The commitment to showing up uh, and, and will really be challenged by the format that the EAS takes. I think uh, from the U.S. point of view, uh, leaders must be able to address substantive issues, as I've said before, uh, without being over-scripted, uh, and they must have some sort of uh, interaction. And there has to be a, a follow-up and delivery mechanism uh, worked within uh, EAS at some point so that when important issues are discussed, uh, there are, uh, there's a Sherpa process and a process to follow up on, on these issues. So the desire for uh, and the need for results-oriented um, and a results-oriented approach, but balanced with an understanding of Asian-style Asian consensus building and confidence building is something, it's a balance I think the, the White House and the, um, and the State Department are trying to strike now. And that's why discussions such as today's are very, very important. We will, um, we will be issuing a report, uh, CSIS will issue a report with, with JETRO after this conference and share some of the ideas uh, that come out of our, our discussions uh, today. Because the stakes are very high this year. And for any of you who've heard uh, Kurt Campbell speak recently, he'll tell you that this is the, one of the most important years for American policy in, uh, in Asia in, in decades. And he's got a good argument about that. As we look forward after Indonesia's chairmanship, uh, we look at, at chairmanship by a number of smaller and newer ASEAN countries who won't have the uh, inherent capabilities and heft to drive uh, some of the key issues um, that need to be on the table um, to, to sustain a serious focus on, on the work um, that 
the East Asia Summit must do. So there's clearly a need for uh, friends of the chair type support, a consensus of, uh, of countries to, to work hard to make those agendas substantive. And there will be a big question, I think, about um, Burma's chairmanship uh, that's due uh, in, in 2014. And it may be, uh, Dr. Surin would, would address this, or it'll come up in the question and answer period. But I think um, the Burma chairmanship offers an opportunity for ASEAN and EAS countries to encourage Burma to make changes, um, to create uh, some space, and possibly step up to being able to, uh, to, to chair uh, credibly in 2014. Or if not, um, it, it seems to me that um, some accommodation should be made for Burma to uh, to step aside so that we don't uh, divert what is um, probably going to be uh, uh, an organization and an architecture that will be more important in our lives going forward uh, than NATO uh, if we think about the next 20 years. So the stakes are very high. Let me end there. And, uh, and I, I want to thank you for uh, <laughs> allowing me to stand in for uh, Senior Director of the National Security Council. I, I was not speaking for him, but I, I tried to uh, pick up some of the key themes that I've uh, detected uh, in my work around town and, and in discussions, and I hope, I hope that was helpful. Next, I'd like to introduce um, a gentleman who is uh, known for his charismatic leadership of, of ASEAN, uh, a man who uh, has led his country as a uh, foreign minister, um, a man who's got um, terrific uh, uh, perspective and credibility uh, in the United States, in Southeast Asia, indeed globally, and um, uh, that is Dr. Surin Pitsawan, the Secretary General uh, from the ASEAN Secretariat. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming him. Thank you very much, Ernie. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Excellency Hubbard, yesterday we, <laughs> I'm trying to think what new I can, I, can I say without repeating myself in front of you, but uh, the presence of uh, His Excellency Mike Moore certainly reminds me of uh, our long relationship. Uh, when uh, you were running for the, the directorship of WTO and uh, Thailand and ASEAN fielded uh, uh, Dr. Supachai. It was the only race that Australia and New Zealand took different roads. <laughs> and it's the only race that India and Pakistan agreed <laughs> that they would support Supachai rather than Mike Moore. But in the end, we came in the middle. In the end, we came in the middle. Yeah, split in the middle. Uh, six years divided by two, half half. But the challenges are still there after you and Dr. Superchai left. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, it is a great honor to be back at the at CSIS at this forum uh, with Jethro. I have just finished my mission, uh, uh, which is uh, an attempt to come to the United States to Boston, to New York, and to Washington to do pretty much the same thing. Uh, now that Mr. Obama is joining uh, the EAS at the end of the year, uh, the American public deserves to know what is it all about. The first time we hear about EAS, what's in there, and why does he have to be there? Particularly this year, he will have to go to Cannes in southern France for G20. After that, he has to host the APEC meeting in Honolulu and then Bali within, uh, within a week. A lot of leaders will have to justify why they have to go to these vacation spots <laughs> consecutively. So I'm helping him too. But your title today, uh, East Asia Summit, Concepts for East Asia Summit, Connectivity, Security, and ASEAN centrality. From my perspective, one word it's missing, and that is the maturing up of ASEAN. Without the confidence that we have made a contribution in the region, that we have 
uh, with our dialogue partners provided the centrality, the spearhead of building new architecture in East Asia. Hillary Clinton said ASEAN is the fulcrum of the region's new architecture of cooperation. Now, to be recognized as the fulcrum of a new architecture being built in East Asia is also to be told and to be informed that you have responsibility. And in the past three or four decades, we have been the centrality of goodwill from all our friends around the world, including New Zealand. Support us cooperate with us, helping us, guide us, because in East Asia, there has not been institutions and processes and systems that could help resolve problems if problems ever occurred. Henry Kissinger, who made this statement, who made this observation at the end of last century, saying that innovation, economy, Science, technology in East Asia, it's 20th century Europe. But as far as institutions, processes, systems to avoid, to prevent, and to resolve problems that could occur between them and among them, and they have so many issues between them and among them, East Asia is pretty much 19th century Europe. What ASEAN has been doing, the service of ASEAN has been providing that centrality because it's a collection of small and medium-sized states, threatening none, accommodating all. So the Chinese are comfortable with us, the Indians are comfortable with us, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Australians, they are comfortable being in the forum, in the in the uh, process that ASEAN is providing with ASEAN hospitality, with all the colorful shirts that we produce, they feel comfortable. And you put them at ease and they work. But in order to provide that centrality into the future, particularly at EAS, centrality of goodwill is not enough. It must be a centrality of substance. And that substance could only come from an exchange like this, from opportunities like this. What do you expect out of the EAS expanded? You don't want to avoid sensitive issues. And I can assure you, Ernie, ASEAN has gone through the last few years absorbing difficult issues. The issue between Thailand and Cambodia, many firsts we have achieved. The chair and the two foreign ministers were called to New York at a meeting by the UN Security Council. Never happened in ASEAN history. The fact that the chair, Minister Marty, could go to the two capitals, never happened in the past. The fact that the foreign ministers were called to a meeting on one issue, and that is Thailand and Cambodia, never happened in the past. And the fact that the UN itself recognizes that there is a regional arrangement out there in the UN language called ASEAN with their own mechanisms, nascent, emerging, still nebulous, just being formed, but they have the intention to do this job. Why don't we throw it back to them? Never happened. So ASEAN has also matured up. ASEAN has to provide that centrality of substance. And to embark upon this challenge, to sit in the chair with Medvedev, with Obama, with Mr. Kang, with Mr. Wen Jiabao, with President Lee, with 
Prime Minister um, uh, Manmohan Singh, with your Prime Minister, Mr. Uh, Moore, ASEAN is going to be taking the responsibility of driving this EAS into the future. Mrs. Clinton said, if they are going to decide and discuss on issues that would have implications on us and our interests, we will seek a seat at that table. And this is it. And you have, it had not just out of the blue. Last two years, Washington has worked very hard with us, showing the genuine interest and commitment for East Asia with ASEAN. First, coming to the meeting, a large part of diplomacy, she said, is showing up. She showed up. Second, has been delayed for a long, long time, the summit between the leaders of ASEAN and the US, it happened. Third, we thought it would take some time accessing to, accessing to uh, our treaty of, treaty of Amity and Cooperation. They did it in a very, very short period of time. So the consistent efforts and goodwill and commitment that has been shown to us certainly has put us in a rather comfortable and, and confident mode that we could welcome you at the EAS this coming November. But let me go back to centrality of substance. It will not be substantive. It will not be cohesive. It will not be uh, integrated. It will not be 600 million market consumers. It will not be 2 trillion GDP combined. It will not be the strategic location of ASEAN between the two major emerging markets, India and China, if we ourselves are not connected, if we ourselves are not integrated, becoming one market, really. So we have this master plan. And the World Bank said, thou shall need 9 trillion US dollars to finish thy plan. <laughs> and the question is, where are we going to get the 8 trillion, 9 trillion US dollars? Not tomorrow, not next year. Luckily, we have Japan. <laughs> Before tsunami, and I, I hope even after tsunami, that will commit. And I have told my ASEAN colleagues that, look, ODA is over. Donation is over. You will have to speak, we will have to speak the language of the market. Meaning, what is it for us? Where is the, what is the profit margin? When is the point of return for us? What is the cash flow look like? It has to be bankable projects. And Japan and the the uh, private sector of Japan, the uh, Keidan Ren of Japan, with the government of Japan, have set up a new mechanism just to participate in this master plan for connectivity for ASEAN. ASEAN will not be taken seriously until ASEAN is connected and integrated. And the in, in the connectivity plan, if you have had some reading about it, there are three components. One is physical infrastructure. In other words, roads, rails, shipping. Half of ASEAN is maritime. It has to be connected. And Mr. Wen Jiabao in, in, uh, in um, Jakarta last, early this month, has already said that. We have the capacity, we have the technology, we have the fleet. We can help connect maritime ASEAN within maritime ASEAN with mainland ASEAN. So we have to think about both uh, 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 mainland uh, and maritime ASEAN to make it a one integrated whole. 
You know, we have done a survey that 40% of the costs of the shipment of a container is due to the loss of time in between from one point to another within the landmass of ASEAN, continental ASEAN. If we have the connectivity and it's being conceived now, if we can connect the Mekong Basin with the South Asian subcontinent, it will be a tremendous synergy between us called India-Mekong Connectivity East-West Corridor. And that would involve Ho Chi Minh City, that would involve Da Nang, that would involve Hanoi, crossing Laos and Cambodia, crossing Thailand into Myanmar, into India, through ship, through roads. And we have found out that for all they want to do in South Asia, in India, economic and industrialization, just one sector, automobile, they don't have enough support industry to feed whatever they plan to do with their small automobiles. The, the, the wheels, the uh, windows, the doors, the seats, all these parts and support industry are much more advanced in the landscape of ASEAN. If the connectivity can be built, it would be much, much safer, not safer, lower cost for the industry in India to be connected with the industries in Southeast Asia. That's East-West Corridor. So the fact that we go into this EAS, definitely we know difficult issues are going to be brought up. Definitely we know that we want to handle these difficult issues too. Definitely we know that we need to be strengthened through connectivity and integration among ourselves physically, institutionally, meaning what? Custom procedures, rules and regulations, standards of goods and services flowing between and among us that also connectivity need to be ironed out. And the third is people-to-people -people connectivity. 70 plus million arrivals of tourists into ASEAN. 47 are from ASEAN to ASEAN. 47 percent. 50 plus percent came from outside. We could increase more we could benefit more, we could encourage more if ASEAN is one really tourist destination. People to people connectivity among ourselves and with those people of goodwill around the world. So Ernie, ladies and gentlemen, we go into the EAS in November with full awareness that we are taking up a very, very challenging task. The centrality of ASEAN is going to be tested. And ASEAN will have to be prepared to face that challenge. And the five issues that Ernie discussed earlier that have been agreed upon since 2005, finance, education, disaster management, avian flu, at that time it was a big, 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 big issue. I'm now trying to change it to pandemic uh, issues. What's the other one? Education, did I miss? Uh, on, yeah, environment. The other two that we are talking about now is comprehensive Asia economic partnership, CPR, for 16, for 18 if we can do it. You have to think ahead into the future. It's not going to be, it's going to take time. But as the leaders sit and deliberate together, that is 
the challenge worth the attention of the leaders. Let us think about complete Asia-wide economic cooperation. And then this very issue, connectivity for ASEAN, so that we could be one integrated, unified, a market, 600, rising purchasing power, expanding middle class, and also doing what we have been doing in the past, which you probably have not noticed, and that is while economic development is being pursued, democracy has also been given attention. Not in the same way, not with the same uh, speed, and not even in the same style. And I was inspired by reading what Mr. Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, had to say. He said, America should show to the world how to walk the paths of liberty. I was struck by him using plural, the paths of liberty. Well, what ASEAN has been doing is also pursuing the paths of democracy in our own way. Achieving economic development, which would legitimize the powers, make sure that it's equally distributed, some have done better than others, and that could legitimize the power. That's why they have been in power for 30 years, some of them. That's why they have been in power for 20 plus years, some of them. But it is different from North Africa and the Middle East. The landscape is not absolutely closed and tightly controlled. In between, there's space. In between, there's room for academics, for intellectuals, for the media, for the civil society. And that's our road to openness. And that's our many roads and many paths to liberty. The coming participation of Mr. Obama in November will be a recognition and a confirmation these small countries, medium-sized and small, have embarked upon a journey that is worth supporting, that is worth recognizing, that is worth rendering your cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Surin. It's now my pleasure to uh, introduce um, uh, Michitaka Nakatomi, the president of JETRO. Uh, Nakatomi-san has one of the most distinguished careers in trade in, uh, in Japan. He has ha held very key uh, positions in the, uh, in the METI uh, before it was METI, and he helped transform the uh, organization uh, over the years. He's been involved in uh, uh, actually negotiating, uh, the, being the lead negotiator for Japan in key FTAs across the globe. And most recently, um, I, and I want to apologize because his uh, resume um, on the uh, and what we handed out ends at 2003, but certainly his his uh, his resume in his career did not end at 2003. He's negotiated uh, for Japan the key uh, free trade agreements that have bound together uh, the East Asia and the Pacific uh, countries. So I hope you'll join me in uh, welcoming uh, Nakatomi-san to talk about uh, connectivity in uh, in the EAS. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bauer, thank you very much for introducing me. Yeah. 
Uh, as I've been uh, the, uh, the president of JETRO since uh, 2008, and soon uh, before that, I was deeply involved in uh, the plurilateral agreement called uh, ACTA. Yeah, and that was a very interesting experience for me, and that I have some experience in collaboration with the U.S. Uh, and that was very helpful at that time. But anyway, I, today I, I'd like to touch upon uh, the connectivity element of uh, EAS. Uh, so, uh, my uh, title today is a uh, connectivity as a foundational concept of uh, uh, EAS. And uh, as uh, so do, uh, Dr. Srin has said in his uh, speech, uh, uh, connectivity, as we use the word here, uh, was uh, extensively discussed uh, among ASEAN members. Uh, the result was uh, presented in uh, the ASEAN Connectivity Master Plan uh, that was adopted at the 17th ASEAN Summit in Hanoi last October. As uh, uh, the slide, uh, this one shows, uh, the plan has three components. Uh, one is soft infrastructure or institutional connectivity. Uh, one is hard infrastructure or physical connectivity. And uh, one is uh, so people to people uh, connectivity. Uh, Japan uh, has been uh, committed to working uh, to achieve the goals of uh, this plan. Uh, with uh, the larger aim of uh, extending the connectivity, uh, not only in ASEAN, but uh, beyond uh, ASEAN countries to include uh, uh, countries like uh, India, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and so on and so, on and so forth. Uh, indeed, I think how to expand this uh, connectivity is going to be an important question for the East Asia Summit. Uh, I, I'd like to explain briefly uh, each element of the, these three components of the plan, uh, focusing especially on soft and hard infrastructure. Uh, first, uh, there is what we call soft infrastructure. Uh, we also call it institutional connectivity uh, because it has basically to do with facilitating the flow of trade and investment. Uh, one important example in this regard and uh, it's an important part of East Asian economic in integration is uh, the abolishment of uh, intra-regional tariffs in the ASEAN free trade area on January the 1st, uh, 2010. On the same day, uh, both uh, the ASEAN India FTA and the ASEAN Australia New Zealand FTA took effect. Uh, these new FTAs added to the existing ASEAN plus one FTAs, that is the individual ASEAN FTAs with uh, Japan, China, and South Korea. And uh, they help to enhance the intra-regional networks throughout East Asia. So now uh, we have all six of what we call ASEAN FTA dialogue partners linked together with ASEAN as the hub. Uh, yes, the picture clearly shows uh, the situation. Uh, it was to enhance this FTA network uh, to some extent that uh, India and Japan uh, signed an economic partnership agreement uh, this past February. Uh, Japan aims to ratify the EPA, uh, FTA, uh, before the end of this year. Uh, recently, I heard Australia uh, announced to launch a negotiation uh, with uh, India. Uh, that's a welcoming uh, signal for us as well. Uh, the next slide uh, shows what's happening to wider FTAs in the region. Uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, this one, sorry, yeah. Uh, this slide shows what's happening to wider FTAs in the region. Uh, right now, uh, two ideas are being discussed at the same time. Uh, one is called uh, uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership in East Asia, as uh, Srin San said, that's called SEPIA, uh, which covers uh, ASEAN plus six uh, countries. ASEAN plus six, of course, means uh, Japan, China, Korea, uh, India, Australia, and New Zealand. 
The other is called the East Asia Free Trade Area, uh, IFTA, uh, covering ASEAN plus three uh, countries. So I'd like to point out a few things about these ideas or schemes. Uh, first, uh, if we look at the intra-regional trade ratio, uh, ASEAN plus six, so uh, uh, in the case of ASEAN plus six, the coverage is 39.2%, whereas ASEAN plus three's uh, internal trade coverage is around 33.7%. Uh, depending on the statistics, I, uh, we can have a bigger numbers for both of them. But anyway, uh, uh, that clearly shows, I think, the difference of the coverage, trade coverage. Uh, second, we must consider the increasing importance of uh, widening the supply chain. A uh, supply chain is essential for all, I think, business uh, so activities. Uh, in fact, as production and services in increase, uh, you may say expanding the supply chain has become an urgent task for businesses. It has become absolutely necessary to extend it uh, beyond ASEAN, for example, to India, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, Dr. Srin spoke about uh, the automobile case. Yes, uh, in Chennai, uh, we have, I think, a Nissan uh, factory. In Bangalore, uh, we have Toyota. If uh, the supply chain is connected to ASEAN, uh, uh, their cost will become definitely lowered. At this moment, uh, from uh, Chennai, Nissan is uh, so, uh, planning uh, to export just to European market. Yeah. Um, Malaysia and India uh, uh, quite recently uh, had an FTA negotiation completed. Uh, it's so another signal that I think ASEAN is linked with uh, India. Uh, now we need to look at ASEAN uh, together with India. The, the connectivity between India and ASEAN is important for Japan and also for ASEAN members. Third, I think such FTAs must contribute to international rulemaking now that, uh, unfortunately, WTO is not functioning uh, properly. Uh, this is a pity, but uh, this is another reason why I think regional FTAs must include Australia, New Zealand, and India. In other words, I think uh, we should pursue the idea of SEPIA, uh, ASEAN plus six. It will uh, definitely complement the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. Uh, I need to explain a bit about TPP. Uh, regarding TPP, uh, Prime Minister Khan's commitment and industry's support remains the same. It's unfortunate that the review process is delayed because of the aftermath of the earthquake. One important step toward the realization of ASEAN plus six is uh, Japan-Australia FDA. As some of you may know, uh, agricultural issues are storing the negotiations on the FDA. But in reality, if we look at uh, taxable agricultural products, uh, the number is only around 9% of total imports so coming from Australia to Japan. So I believe we can work out an agreement if both countries make proper efforts. And if uh, Japan-Australia FDA is realized, what, that, that will be pay, uh, paving, I think, uh, the basis for ASEAN plus six uh, FDA, de definitely. Japan and uh, we at JETRO uh, providing our share of uh, so a contribution uh, in such fields as uh, so trade facilitation, uh, intellectual property, and human resources development from the perspective of people-to-people uh, -people connectivity. But I can give you some examples. Regarding uh, uh, trade facilitation, 
But we are now also trying to introduce uh, approved export uh, systems for fast track system. And we are now uh, so, uh, developing a, a national single window with the members of ASEAN. Uh, we are now also trying to in, uh, introduce uh, so qualification system for log logistics management. And regarding uh, IPL, we are giving help for uh, providing, I think, support for anti-counterfeit and pi piracy, I think, regime. And uh, we are working on ACTA as well. But those activities are all related to uh, connectivity uh, in software areas. But next, uh, so I would like to touch upon the briefly on uh, hard infrastructure. Uh, let me move, uh, uh, sorry, uh, hard infrastructure is so-called uh, physical connectivity uh, in certain circumstances. As uh, you can readily imagine, hard infrastructure means so airports, roads, railways, and seaports, as well as uh, information and communication technologies, uh, which include fiber optics uh, networks. Uh, to improve the connectivity of uh, ports and railways, uh, we need not just the support of uh, the government of each ASEAN country, but also uh, the support of uh, such international organizations are, as uh, AREA, uh, ADB, and uh, the governments of non-ASEAN member countries. Well, uh, the resources are not enough. But, uh, certainly, it's impossible to, uh, just to depend on official uh, development assistance. There are, as you know, two ways of uh, developing and improving hard infrastructure, uh, through public work programs and through uh, a public-private partnership, PPP or PFI. With public finance strained in many countries these days, I expect public-private partnership to become increasingly important in the coming years. I believe that's the same in uh, the US, and of course uh, that's the case in Japan, but uh, that's a reality in ASEAN as well. Uh, page four uh, uh, gives an outline of the comprehensive Asia development plan uh, that area has worked out for the region including ASEAN and India. Uh, this plan envisions 700 development projects was 390 billion US dollars. Of these projects, uh, 154, uh, which are uh, estimated to be worth 85 billion US dollars, are uh, expected to be carried out through uh, uh, public-private partnerships, uh, PPP. Uh, considering the magnitude of the plan, I think that we should work out realistic and uh, specific details for its realization. In any event, I think these development projects must go beyond the ASEAN region. Uh, please look at the uh, uh, next uh, slide. Sorry, again, <laughs> back, this one. <laughs> uh, this shows uh, infrastructure development projects in the Mekong region. Uh, uh, Dr. Srin spoke about uh, uh, the corridor, but uh, Japan is uh, so involved in these uh, so projects, and they are called the Mekong Japan Economic and Industrial Cooperation Initiative. It mainly consists of two ideas of corridors. One is the uh, East-West Economic Corridor, uh, which links Danam, Vietnam, and Mola Min in Myanmar via Laos and Thailand. The other is the Southern uh, Economic Corridor, which connects uh, Ho Chi Minh City to Bangkok via Cambodia. Uh, there is also a future plan to ex uh, extend the Southern Economic Corridor to Dawei uh, in Myanmar, uh, located directly uh, 250 kilometer, uh, kilometer from Bangkok. Uh, the projects also include uh, development of ports located in the southern part of uh, Thailand, such as Lanon Port, in the southern and western part of the country, as well as uh, of uh, deep water port in Dawei. Uh, these ports are gateways to uh, South India, uh, such as Chennai and Ennol. Clearly, also important are the projects to develop uh, logistics infrastructures linking ASEAN with uh, outside ASEAN regions, uh, such as South India. 
All this, of course, is to improve regional connectivity. Of course, the range of benefits which, uh, which each infrastructure development project would bring in are different. It's necessary to prioritize the projects prior to launch of the development. In the enhancement of physical connectivity, uh, development of hardware infrastructure tends to take a center stage. However, some ASEAN member countries, such as uh, the inland uh, island state, uh, Indonesia, uh, strongly urge development of maritime connectivity. Uh, for your reference, I would like to mention that Japan Coast Guard has made a great contribution to the capacity building of uh, maritime security authorities in Indonesia, Malaysia, and others aimed at ensuring freedom of navigation uh, in the high seas. Uh, here, so I would like to introduce to you some specific uh, projects uh, Japan and Australia are working together uh, uh, in the third countries. I, I myself uh, heavily involved in the activities. I hope uh, the explanation uh, may give you a hint, of, uh, hint for possible future collaboration uh, between uh, the U.S. and other countries in ASEAN. And, of course, I'm not uh, saying that the same method can be applied to U.S. involvement in connectivity-related act activities in ASEM, but uh, I just would like to uh, give you a hint how we can coordinate. Uh, we are undertaking these projects uh, at the behest of uh, businesses in both countries, uh, Japan Australia Business Cooperation Committee and Australia Japan Business Cooperation Committee. Yeah. As many of you know, uh, the Japanese Australian trade relationship is complementary. That is to say, Japan imports from Australia energy and other natural resources, as well as food products, while exporting uh, to Australia transport equ equipment. Uh, general machinery and so on and so forth. Additionally, as uh, it was pointed out uh, during the Australia-Japan Joint Business Conference held in Tokyo uh, last, uh, two years ago, the relative importance of services industries has grown in uh, both economies. Uh, we must strengthen our business relationship in services sector, uh, the joint communique said, to deal with this development. Uh, following the conference, uh, Mr. Mimura, uh, chairman of uh, Nippon Steel Corporation, uh, he's uh, chairman of o Japan Australia Business Corporation Committee, uh, he asked me to chair uh, its infrastructure subcommittee on the Japanese side. Now, uh, the, the cost of infrastructure development in Asia over the next 10 years is estimated to reach uh, uh, the rebel was 750 billion US dollars or more. Uh, we cannot ex uh, expect ODA uh, to, to supply all the cost. And the money coming from international agencies uh, so is not enough. Uh, private funds are indispensable. Uh, here again, uh, Australia and Japan are complementary. Australia excels in organizing a PPP and raising in infrastructure funds. While uh, Japan excels in construction and engineering technologies, and its government uh, can work out excellent financing uh, schemes for in infrastructure uh, using uh, uh, JDIC, JICA, and so on and so forth. With this background, as uh, the slides show, AJBCC uh, sent sent an infrastructure mission to Japan in March 2009, while uh, JABCC dispatched their mission in August of the same year to Australia to examine uh, potential infrastructure investment. These missions have clarified the institutional factors uh, which may hinder infrastructure investment in the both countries uh, and have uh, compiled the uh, proposals on the clarified uh, factors. That's on the page nine of uh, the hand handout. In uh, March this year, the first Australia-Japan uh, public-private policy dialogue 
was held in Tokyo, where both uh, public and private sectors affirmed uh, their resolve to extend cooperation towards infrastructure, uh, not only in Japan and in Australia, but also in Asia in general. As to our activities in third countries, uh, we organized a joint mission of around 60 people and sent it to India last July in order to identify possible ways for us to cooperate in India's infrastructure market through a PPP method. Uh, soon after this, uh, uh, next week, uh, we, we will send uh, another uh, uh, similar joint mission to Indonesia. Uh, Mr. Mimula, Chairman of Nippon Steel himself, and I will take part in it. So far, I've explained the ideas of uh, soft and hard connectivity in and with uh, ASEAN. Now, I uh, wish to turn to the need to ask the United States to join us in these endeavors. I hope uh, you will take up uh, this possibility during the seminar today. After all, uh, this November, the United States, along with Russia, is scheduled to join the East Asian Summit as new members. In my view, it's entirely possible, uh, even desirable, for the US and Japan and other countries to take the initiative in enhancing soft and hard and also people-to-people -people connectivity in East Asia as Australia and Japan have. In some of the emerging economies, for example, uh, urbanization is creating growing problems. I think the US and Japan can surely work together in promoting, for example, uh, projects in these areas. Uh, there can be other so cooperative projects as well in various fields. Regarding, I think, uh, uh, the example of uh, Japan-Australia uh, collaboration, of course, I'm not uh, speaking about uh, uh, the same method, but there are various ways the U.S. can contribute to uh, naturalizing uh, connectivity within ASEAN and also uh, so trying to link ASEAN with other countries. In conclusion, I wish to suggest that the U.S., Japan, and other like-minded countries discuss the possibility of working out a roadmap for cooperation in building ASEAN's connectivity, soft and hard, and also people-to-people -pe -people connectivity in ASEAN, and also with other countries ahead of the coming East Asia Summit in Bali, Indonesia. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Hamry, um, Dr. Surin, Pitsuan, and Nakatomi-san for excellent uh, presentations. I hope uh, you have a chance to digest uh, their remarks, and uh, we're going to take a short break, and we'll hear from our panel, and we'll engage in uh, a dialogue and get your responses to these ideas, and, uh, and we'll hear from our expert panel. So let's take about five minutes. We're a little behind time and we'll get back together at, uh, in five minutes. Thank you.